talk a little bit about heroes and really characteristics of heroes more than anything. Of course, my hero is Jesus Christ, and he trusts that he's, I trust that he's yours as well. And he's the one that sets the example for us. But there are some qualities in heroes that I want to really focus in on today. Let's pray for a moment. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we thank you. That you're always near. You're with us. The Bible says that even when there's just a couple of us that get together, you always show up in our midst, and you know today, Lord, I need your anointing, the quickening of the Holy Spirit. As it's not the words that I prepared, no, it's your words that make the difference. So speak to our hearts, speak to our lives, change us, and we give you thanks for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, in these days, it's been kind of interesting. Uh, I've never quite been here before, where I am right now in life. And uh, I know that we've seen so many times, Avery and I have, how the Lord has led us from one thing to another. And there's a lot of times where it's been a huge step of faith, where we just haven't, couldn't see the end from the beginning. Um, Avery wrote a book of some of those stories. Uh, she handed them out to the ladies in the luncheon a while back. And uh, I think there's uh, one or two in the library you can check out if you want to see it or, uh, or make her famous by buying them and giving them to all of her friends. But, uh, but I just say that she tells some of our stories in there, how what God has done over the years is amazing. He speaks to your heart, and when you follow him, no matter how silly it seems at the time, how unnerving it seems at the time, it's amazing how God always redeems those steps of faith. If you're willing to step there, it's amazing the power that will come behind you to see to it that everything that he asks for in your life will become fulfilled. He'll accomplish much if you're just obedient. And it was a few years ago that I felt that there's a stirring in my heart. God was doing something different and unique. And I'm about to see it fulfilled in, here at Trinity. And I am totally excited about the future of this church. Uh, Pastor Rob and Betsy are just absolutely a gift from heaven, and I believe it's in his time that he's raised them up to be the pastors of this church, and I trust and pray more than anything. You give him your full support, please. Be behind them as a couple. Pray for them that God would guard their hearts and minds, protect them and keep them, and, and give him words of life for this church, and I know that he will. But... Uh, as I think about this time of life where, you know, I just turned 64 the other day. It's amazing. I had to ask Avery how old I was. She didn't, yeah. <laughs> she, she didn't know. I mean, well, no, she did. I didn't know. But, but uh, you know, you get up there at this stage of life and you do a lot of thinking about your legacy and about what you've done, what you've accomplished, the direction that you've gone through. And... Um, a couple things came to my mind about this legacy idea, and I'm going to tie that into this message this morning about heroes. Proverbs 13:22 says this, a good man leaves an inheritance, an inheritance to his children's children. And then in Psalm 112, the second part of verse 6, the righteous will be remembered forever, forever. How do you do that? How, how do you leave an inheritance for your children and their children and on down through the generations? How is it that the righteous will be remembered? How do you do that? How do you leave a lasting, permanent legacy? The Bible tells us that there are four qualities, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on these, qualities that you can find in people who are respected. And if you want to build a lasting legacy then you need to build your life around these four character qualities. Some of them are going to be real obvious to you, but they're things that we need to spend a little bit of time on in this particular service. The first quality, of course, is integrity. Speak with integrity. What do heroes, real heroes do? Well, they're integral. They're, they, all of them are together. The way that they think, the things that they do, they all line up together. If you want to be a person of integrity, there are some keys. Always tell the truth. Always speak the truth. Always keep your word. And always practice or do what you say that you believe. Those are the keys to integrity. 
In Proverbs 17, verse 7, in the message paraphrase, it says, we don't expect eloquence from fools, nor do we expect lies from our leaders. See, all leadership is really built upon one thing, and that's trust. You've got to have trust. You don't follow somebody that you don't trust, and all trust is really built on truth. So you don't follow someone who doesn't tell you the truth. So if you want to be a leader, you have to learn how to speak the truth. If you don't tell the truth and nobody trusts you, if they don't trust you, they're not going to follow you, you can't lead. It's all taken away from you. Why is it that when we look around our society today that there's so little trust in leaders? Well, it's primarily because they've spoken too many lies. There are too many people out there that don't trust their leaders, so it's harder and harder for them to follow. And they lack integrity. And as a result, nobody follows them. If you want to build a lasting legacy, you have to start at that foundation of rock-ribbed integrity. In Proverbs 25, 14, in the New Living Translation, it says, a person who promises a gift but doesn't give it is like clouds and wind that bring no rain. Have you ever failed to keep a promise? I know I have. Let me jog your memory a little bit. Here are some common unkept promises. I would ask you to raise your hand if you've ever said this, but I don't think I will. I'll return it as soon as I'm done with it. I won't tell anyone what you told me. The check is in the mail. I'll be home at 6, honey. <laughs> we can play this weekend. We'll do it when things settle down. My diet begins tomorrow. <laughs> if you want to be a person of lasting legacy. you got to learn to keep your word. Studies have shown that the number one cause of resentment in children is broken promises by their parents. We make promises to our kids and then we break them. You make a promise and then you say, well, I'm, I'm just too tired tonight. You know, I've been too busy at work. I, I just don't have the energy to do it. And as a result, you break your promise to your children. You're modeling a lack of integrity. You've got to keep your word. You've got to tell the truth. You've got to practice what you believe. Is it easy to live with integrity? No, of course not. It's hard. That's why we need God's help to do it. We can't do it on our own. You need to make as your prayer this next verse from Psalm 101, verse 2. He says, I will be careful to live a blameless life. When will you come to help me? I will lead a life of integrity in my own home. I love the, that little phrase right in the middle of that. When will you come and help me? David realizes what we all know, and that is it's desperately hard to keep every promise to do everything in your life with perfect integrity. And he's saying, when are you going to come help me? I need your help, Lord. It's not easy. Why? Because people know you. And they know what you've said. And it's hard to live up to some of those things. I have a definition of success that I stole from my former pastor that I've used many times, but I believe that success is when those who know you best love and respect you the most. When those who are close to you love and respect you the most. That's success. It's easy to impress people from a distance because they don't see you up close. They don't see the little faults and foibles and warts. They don't, they don't see all that. But real integrity is when those who know you best respect you the most. That's integrity. Now, first, then, you must speak with integrity, and second, you've got to serve with intensity. Real heroes serve with intensity. Be a servant to other people around you. You know, they've done a study after, after study of kids, and they ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's always interesting, the response. But, you know, never once has a child ever said, I want to be a servant. <laughs> never once have they said, I want to be a servant. Not one kid has ever said that. We don't want to be servants when we grow up. We want to be celebrities, stars, winners, leaders. But Jesus said, and you know the Scripture, in Mark 9, 35, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. That's where our first place is in the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's a little bit contrary to the way that most children respond to that question. What do you want to be when you grow up? 
Servanthood. That's the second key to a lasting legacy, serving other people. Proverbs 14, 22, in the New Living Translation, it says, if you plan to do good, you will receive unfailing love and faithfulness. If you plan to do good. The fact is, most people only work for their own good. We're all selfish people. There's, you don't see anybody but yourself when you look in the mirror. You're it. You're the center of your world. You see things through a filter that you've, been, you've created of yourself. We work for our dreams, for our ambitions, for our goals, for the things that we put value on. We think about what we want. We're not thinking about the good of other people. We're thinking about our retirement. That's why most people never leave a lasting legacy. They don't serve with intensity. They may work with intensity, but it's all for selfish purposes. For, and, and if it's selfish reasons, it can't be good in the kingdom of heaven. In Colossians 3.23, in the NIV, says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord and not for human masters. Real key, be enthusiastic, be eager to help other people. Be ready to serve. Serve with intensity, with all your heart, it says right here in this passage in Colossians 3. No matter what you do, do it with all your heart. And what's the motivation behind it? It's as if you're doing it for the Lord. Christ is the one that's instructing you to do it, so how can you do it half-heartedly? Do it all for Him. He's paid for your life with His own blood. So serve Him with intensity. It says no matter what you do, do it as unto the Lord. I'm going to make my bed today for you, Lord. I'm going to clean the house today for you. I'm going to make this sale for you today. I'm going to serve this client for you. Everything that you do during the course of your day, if you do it as unto the Lord, it adds an intensity to it because you remember what He's done for you. And when you do it in the name of God, for God, it becomes an act of service, serving others, serving God. Do it with intensity. You know, I, I, I can't think of this verse, whatever you do, do it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for human masters, but not think of people around here that I've seen that have just done incredible things with incredible intensity for God. You know, I, I, I can't help, and I've mentioned them before, I know Vanessa and Dave Murray, what they've done with these kids is remarkable to me. You know, the fact that their own kids, grown four super kids, most of all of them really involved in ministry today, and, and then they, they started taking in these other kids from cracked babies to difficult kids and taking them into their home. And now, what do you have, eight more that you've adopted? I mean, just amazing just doing it with intensity because they know it's for God. These kids wouldn't have any hope if it wasn't for those kinds of people. The Merrills, others who have done the same thing, they just love kids and they want to give them a shot and they're willing to go after the ones that don't have anybody else. What an amazing gift that is. I think of people like Cindy Chapel. I mean, my goodness, Cindy, is there anything else you can't do? I mean, this lady is involved in so many things. She, she left a great job career at the post office to write a Christian book and to get involved in other kinds of ministry. Today, she's in the prison. She treats these women in prison like her own daughters and sisters, loving them to Christ. It's just incredible. And it follows up with them after they get out and takes care of them, involved in Adopt-A-Block in the inner city and umpteen thousand other ministries and always greets people with a smile. How are you doing, Cindy? I'm happy every time. I'm happy. She's always happy. Why? Because she's serving with intensity for the Lord. And so many others. Renee that was up here and all that. And I don't know how. Some of you, these are all ladies I'm mentioning. I think they just have more energy than men do. I, I, I'm reminded of that sign. And I've mentioned it this morning to a couple on my personnel director's wall when I was working back at the Beeler Young Company years ago that said that for women to succeed in the workplace, they have to work twice as hard as men. But fortunately, that's not too difficult. <laughs> But it is incredible, you know, when you think of people like, well, the Penningtons, you know, the Ken and 
these guys, I mean, my goodness, they, when they came into this church, they didn't hesitate. They jumped right into ministry. They, both, I mean, Ken and Pam, Miranda, just jumping in there. What can I do? What can I do? How can I serve? And Miranda doing the, the dance stuff with the teens and all the other, I mean, and leading worship. You guys are incredible, but they don't, they do it with intensity. They didn't, they didn't come here to take a break. They came here to get involved in ministry. The stockfish is the same way, and so many others. I think of Don and Teresa Cassing that, oh my goodness, how many of you have come through that west door and seen Don just won't let you alone till he <laughs> greets you and speaks into you and tells you how great it is to see you, and you just, you talk about intensity. This guy's got intensity, but we serve with intensity. If you want to leave a legacy, you must do that. You can't hold back. You've got to give it all that you have because that's what God is asking of us. You know, Cody up here, my goodness, you know, I watched this young guy down there in El Salvador just so much in love with Jesus. Now here he is, you know, he's going to school full time. He's doing that thing with Kettering back and forth between work and now you said you're working now, you're in that part of it, and then in the classroom, another six months or however that works. But all in the middle of this, with everything else he's got going on, he's just got such a burden to pray, just came and said, can we start a Friday night prayer service in the church? And that's the kind of stuff that warms a pastor's heart. Can I do this ministry? Instead of, you know what you need, pastor? You need one of these ministries. No, here's a guy that says, I want to come and do this ministry. Wow! What a gift from heaven, intense. He believes in a cause. He trusts in God. He's believing for a change in this city, and he's willing to do something about it. You know, a lot of us just talk about things. I love the doers, and there are so many here that are because they're intense over the ministry. They're excited because these things, the, the ministry, the expansion of the kingdom, those are the only things that count in this life. Everything else is going to pass. You can work for status. You can work for fame. You can work for money. All those things are going to pass. They're not going to make any difference in the end. But when you're doing it for God, man, there are kingdom eternal results, and it's always worth the price. Trust Him. The Bible says that there are two things that are going to last for eternity. Only two things that last. First one is truth. Two things that last forever. You should build truth into your life. And what is truth? That's God's Word. The Word is true. The Bible says in Matthew 24, again in Mark 13, and in Luke 21, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my Word won't pass away. It's going to be there forever. It was and it will be. And throughout all eternity, the truth will stand because the truth is the Word of God. In Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God abides forever. It lasts forever. It's there. You can trust it. So build your life on that book. Believe the truths that are there. The more you build biblical eternal truths into your life, the more you're building an eternal legacy because those are things that are eternal. They're going to last forever. It'll be true 2,000 years from today just as it was 2,000 years ago. Build your life on truth if you want a legacy. And the second thing is people. People. People are made to last forever. Everybody is going to last forever one of two places, heaven or hell. You say, well, you believe there's a heaven and a hell? Absolutely, and I'm not alone. Jesus believed it. God says there's a heaven and a hell. He knows more about it than you and I do, and so I'm going to believe it from Him. But you were made to last forever. One day your heart's going to stop. This body's going to give up and die. But that's not going to be the end of you. We were made to be eternal. What you do on earth and what you commit to is going to determine where you spend eternity. Have you accepted the love of God as a gift from heaven to you, his forgiveness, the forgiveness of Jesus Christ that he offered. Have you asked him to be your Savior, your Lord? Have you determined that you're going to follow him for the rest of your life? That's what you need. He's your only ticket to heaven. There is no one else. No man comes to the Father except by the Son, Jesus Christ. You must come through Jesus Christ. Everyone does. So if you want to build a lasting legacy, build it on two things that'll last. Invest in the truth, the Word of God, 
and invest in other people. Serve them, love them, help them, encourage them, bring them into the kingdom, help them get to know God, people and the Word. Those are the only two things that are going to last. Everything else is one day going to burn up. This earth itself I'm not talking about just everything on the earth. The earth itself is going to be consumed by fire. It'll all be destroyed one day. The only things that last are people and the Word. The only two. Everything else. Yesterday's heroes are all forgotten about. You, you can't sit here today probably and name for me the MVP in, the, in Major League Baseball over the past six years. You couldn't even name them. You couldn't name for me the last five uh, female actress Oscar winners. You couldn't name. I mean, they're all gone. They all fade. Our memories are gone of those kinds of accomplishments. And there are people out there that do wonderful, great things, awesome things that took them a lifetime to achieve. And nonetheless, those kinds of achievements are just going to fade. They'll be a distant memory, and pretty soon they'll be gone, especially when you get to be 64. Will you still love me? Will you? Anyway, but, but we don't remember them. Achievements, they vanish. Awards tarnish. You know, I, I just recently got into a, uh, I, because we're going through all of our stuff, moving and all that stuff, you go through all these old things that you have that at the time they were presented to you, you thought they were really important. But, oh, I forgot I got this. No one else knows either. <laughs> you know, it, but at the time it was like this big accomplishment. But what you find is once you get to the top, there's nothing left but down. <laughs> the, the people who've left a legacy in your life usually are the ones who served you in love. They're the ones that really matter. They're the ones that you remember. The Bible says in Psalm 37, 18, day by day the Lord observes the good deeds done by godly men and he gives them eternal rewards. So speak with integrity, serve with intensity, and give with generosity. Give with generosity. The Bible makes it clear that we make a living by what we get in life, but we make a legacy by what we give. You'll never leave a legacy unless you learn to become a generous giver of your time, your money, your effort, your energy, your talents. You need to be a giver. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 9, in the New Living Translation says, As the Scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their deeds, their good deeds will be remembered, how long? Forever. Andrew Carnegie, the great philanthropist, he died, uh, when he died, they found in his desk a little piece of paper on which he'd written out his life mission. As a young man, he said, I'm going to spend the first half of my life making as much money as I can. I'm going to spend the second half of my life giving it all away. Carnegie did exactly that. In his lifetime, he gave away more than $450 million. Carnegie Hall, Carnegie Institute, Carnegie Foundation. You know, you, you can find his name all over the place. He gave it all away. If he'd kept it, he'd be a nobody today. People will remember him because of what he gave. And some of you are thinking, boy, that's a great idea. I think I'll do that. I'll spend the first half of my life making all the money I can and the second half giving it all away. But there's only one problem with that. We don't know where the halfway point is. <laughs> you might have already passed it a long time ago. We don't know where that point is. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. You're not guaranteed next week, next month. You know, I suggest that you start being generous now, not at some future point. And if you want to have a lasting legacy, you've got to learn to be generous. Why should we be generous? Well, there's a number of reasons why. Number one is because God wants you to be, a, he, he wants you to be generous because He wants you to be like Him. Has God been generous in your life? He lavished salvation on us when we didn't deserve it. He gives us good gifts. He's generous. And He wants you to learn to have His character, to be like Him. Secondly, and you never, you're never going to be remembered for what you spend on yourself. <laughs> you can get out there and you can have all kinds of nice things. People are not going to remember you for what you had. Nobody remembers that. No, they're going to rem remember you by the way you helped other people, by the way you invested in their lives, by the way you gave what you had for the sake of the kingdom. Third, you're not going to take it with you. <laughs> We've said that before. There, you'll never find a U-Haul behind a hearse. It just doesn't work that way. <laughs> You didn't bring anything into the world, and guess what? You're not taking anything out either. When you die, you're going to leave it all here. And it's not really yours. 
it isn't really yours while you were here. Everything you have is really a loan from God. We're just stewards. He's the owner. Proof is you're going to die, and it's all going to go to somebody else. And it won't be his either because it came from God. He's going to die, and you get the story. It's all God's. Everything is his. We think it's ours because we did something in order to participate with him in the receiving of it, but nonetheless, it wasn't ours and at any time, and it wasn't our employers. It was always God's. Everything that we have, it all came from him. So would you spend your life not giving away what's not yours anyway? I mean, come on. Third, or fourth, rather, you, you learn the joy of giving by learning to be generous now, today. Some of you say, well, I'm... I'm going to leave it all to a foundation. When I retire, when I die, I'm going to give it all to the church. I want to say, do your giving while you're living, then you'll be knowing where it's going. (laughs) Amazing things happen when you become generous. A couple of scriptures, Proverbs 11.25, he says, the generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. God so badly wants you to become like him, to be a giver, to be generous. He says, well, let's play a little game then. Let's see who can give the most, you or me. You'll never be able to outgive God in your life. So the more you're a blessing to others, the more God blesses your life. That's the way it is. What kind of giver are you? You know, I discovered there are basically three kinds of givers. There are people who are givers like a flintlock. You know, you you have to take a hammer and hammer it, and then the sparks fly. There are flinty givers. You hit them, and the sparks start flying. (laughs) Then there are some people who are sponge givers. To get anything from them, you just got to squeeze them real hard. You put the squeeze on. The more you squeeze, the more it comes out. Well, God doesn't want you to be a sponge giver or a flint giver. He wants you to be a honeycomb giver. You overflow with sweetness. You're always giving. You're always helping. You're always sharing. You're always serving. You're generous with yourself and with what you have, not stingy. It's the generous that receive a lasting legacy. Bob Hope once said that if you have no generosity in your heart, you you have the worst kind of heart disease if you have no generosity in your heart. Don't have a stingy heart. If you want to build a lasting legacy with your life, build it on something that lasts. Speak with integrity. Serve with intensity. Give with generosity. And if you do these three things, you'll be a success, and you'll be able to master most of life. So you're going to need number four, and that is to succeed with humility. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, verse 23, Pride lands you flat on your face. Humility prepares you for honors. (laughs) You'll leave a legacy, but you need to stay humble or you'll stumble. That's real key in your life. I always say, remember the lesson of the whale. When you get to the top and you're ready to blow, that's when somebody's going to harpoon you. (laughs) I heard about two Texas ranchers who were bragging about their ranches. One guy said, what's the name of your cattle ranch? And he said, the Circle W Rocking R Rolling B Around the World Rainbow Ranch. (laughs) That's quite a name. You must have quite a big herd of cattle. No, not really. Few of them survived the branding. (laughs) it's, It's all image. God uses a couple things to test your humility. One of them is praise. The Bible says praise is the test of character. Every time you're complimented, it's a test. Are you going to get egotistical about it? Are you going to get stuck up and prideful? You know, the human species is the only species that when you pat them on the back, their head expands. (laughs) You need to be humble. Treat praise like you treat criticism. It's like bubble gum. You chew on it, you don't swallow it. Ultimately, ultimately, though, it doesn't matter what other people think about you and me. What really matters is what God thinks about you, what he thinks about me. God uses praise to test your character. The other thing God uses is mistakes. He uses mistakes to te- test your character. 
Someone who won't learn will be poor and disgraced. Anyone who listens to correction is respected, the word says. You don't have to know it all to be respected. You just have to admit that you don't know it all. Because nobody knows it all. Nobody but Jesus. Humility is being honest about your weaknesses. Being honest about what you don't know. Being honest about your foibles, your own faults, your weaknesses. You know the words humility and humor come from the same root word? Humility and humor. A humble person has the ability to laugh at himself or herself. You know, I've heard it said that if, when you learn to laugh about yourself, you'll be happy all your life because you never run out of material. <laughs> Prideful people can't stand to have their flaws pointed out. They can't stand it. They can't joke about it. They can't laugh about it. The problem is we take ourselves far too seriously and God not seriously enough. That's the cause of a lot of stress in this life. We need to reverse that. We need to take God far more seriously than we do and not take ourselves and our work so seriously. Learn to be humble. The secret of being a leader, the secret is to always be a learner, to always be growing, always learning, always willing to admit that you don't know it all and that you need to find out. You may be successful, but you, you're not perfect. You need to succeed with humility. The enemy of humility is image. Our society is image. They are image obsessed. You can even hire image coordinators, image consultants who will teach you how to dress right, walk right, talk right, eat right, act right, say the right things, and how to wear just the right clothes. The Bible says, clothe yourselves with humility. Humility should be the clothes that you're wearing. That's the best dress for success. Clothes yourself, clothes yourself with humility. We, we think that the way to be respected is to build up some phony image of perfection and having it all together. Everyone knows you don't have it all together. Don't kid yourself. But we try to build this. We, we think if we show people that we're perfect, that we've got it all together, then they'll love us. You know, the opposite is true. If you're honest with yourself before others, then they'll love you. Then you're approachable. Nobody likes being around people who think that they have it all together because we all know they don't. Instead, we actually like to hang out with humble people. We love humble people not prideful, perfect people. Don't, don't worry about your image. Worry about your character. Image is what other people say you are. Character is who you really are. Character is what God says you are. Character is what you are when you're alone in the dark. Image just vanishes. It's gone. Character lasts for eternity. You're not taking your image with you. God couldn't care less about your image. He doesn't care that you walked out of the bathroom dragging some toilet paper stuck on your shoe. He doesn't give a rep. He probably gets a good laugh about it. He doesn't care. He doesn't care that uh, that thing on your head isn't on quite straight. He doesn't care about that, like some of us do. It's important for us to understand God looks at the heart, and we need to look there. We need to help become the kind of person he wants us to be so that we can leave a lasting legacy. That's what a hero is. That's what a Christian hero is. It's someone who is working and who has and has embraced these character qualities. And we've begun to live them. The greatest legacy of all, helping somebody come to know, to know Jesus Christ. Help somebody get out of hell and get into heaven. Wow. Wow. The greatest thing that you can do for someone, the greatest thank you or mark, rather, that you can do on this earth, if you want to make a mark here, is to lead somebody to Jesus Christ. Help them to see that there's hope for a life that's lost in Christ and nowhere else. That's the greatest thing. Is anybody going to be in heaven because of you? Because you took the time to tell them. That's the greatest, greatest legacy that you can leave. Tell your brother, your sister, your mother, your father. Let them know. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. And you want to be with them together for eternity. Learn how to be a Christian hero. Take these qualities and begin to adopt them as your own. 
begin to live for Jesus Christ. Once you do that, you're going to make an impact on this city that will never, never be erased. It's amazing what God will do when you surrender your heart and life completely to him. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we're just so thankful. Not only, Lord, for the example you give us in your truth, your word, that show us how to live and teach us. If we'll just take and apply those scriptures to our life, we'd find that it would be much easier than we thought. But God, not only did you give us those, that word that's true and that's eternal, and that will go with us everywhere we go forever, but Lord, you gave us examples people in our lives, and we've talked about it before, but there are people that have gifts for us. There are truly humble, serving people that we meet every day that we know that have gifts for us, things, Lord, that we need, qualities that we need built into our lives, and I pray that we will never get to the place where we think we don't need them, because, Lord, we need each other. We need each other in this church. We need the ones who serve as an example to those that might be weak in that area. We need those who speak, Lord, words of integrity and truth and honor. God, we need them in our lives for those of us that might struggle in that area and want to pass on rumors and those kinds of things. God, help us to find those around us that live exemplary lives and begin to adopt the principles that we see of Christ in them to our lives. God, help us. And Lord, right now, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, you know, there might be someone here that you just didn't know that you had a God that loved you so much that he wants to take you to heaven. And not only that, but he's already paid the price. Your ticket has been paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. And he's the only way, the only truth, the only life that we can truly live is found in him. Don't resist him. Maybe you've been resisting him your whole life. You've had people around you that have showed you the way and pointed out the path. But for some reason, you've thought, no, I'm going to try something else. It's too simple. It's too old-fashioned for me to give my life to Christ. But right now, you know... The Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. You know that there's only one way, and it's in Christ, and it's time that you give it up. You say, Lord, I need you in my life, and I know it. You're everything that I need. I'm done passing that along. I'm, I'm ready to receive it. And in this moment, right now, you can know that you're his. You can walk out of this church knowing. You don't have to wonder where you stand with God. The Bible says that His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. You can know that right now if you'll just accept Him and His incredible gift for your life. Will you do that today? With your heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's you, and you'd say, Pastor, pray for me. I need Christ in my life. I can't go another step without Him, and I know it then I want you to take a step of faith and just lift your hand up real high right now. Just lift it up. By lifting your hand, you're saying, Pastor, pray for me. I need him. I need him in my life. Sure, over here. Others, lift them up. Say, yes, Lord. Yes. Jesus. Jesus. It's you, Lord, and you only. I need you. Everyone pray this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. You're all I need. I've been going the wrong way for too long, and I've decided in this moment to accept you as my Savior and Lord. I believe you, Jesus, that you are God who came in the flesh, who lived a sinless life, who died for my sins, but on the third day, the grave couldn't hold you. But you rose up out of that death. And today you're at the right hand of God. Praying for me. I believe. And I trust you. As my Savior and Lord. And I'm determined. From this day on. I'm going to live for you. I'm not looking back. I'm only looking forward. For your glory's sake. In Jesus name. Amen and amen.